Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hello there, Perpetual Chess listeners. We've got a few exciting announcements before we get into the episode. So please, please, please don't skip ahead. You've got to hear this. It's important. Number one, just a quick formatting note. This is the first of its kind, a reunion episode with adult improvers. We're bringing back some of the adult improvers to find out what's going on with their chess. We brought back the two original guests, Andres Krizdwa and Stacia Pugh. It's been so cool to see the format of this show grow. When I did the first interview with Andres, I didn't know how much the interest there would be in hearing from the working man's player, the not professional sect. And it turns out that these are amongst the most popular episodes. And I think if you go back and listen to Andres and Stacia's original interviews, if you haven't heard them already, I think you'll know why. And the sequels are quite insightful as well. And it's just good to to hear what's going on with them and to hear that you know, chess can be a struggle for everyone. No, no one's growth is linear. And if you haven't heard the original interviews, I would recommend you listen to them. But like any good sequel, these interviews can also be listened to as a standalone item. Number two, a perpetual chess listener is going to run a randomized controlled trial for chess improvement which is pretty exciting. He's going to have different groups try out different study methods like woodpecker method, just doing regular puzzles, so on and so forth. He knows all the details. It's primarily for people rated like if you're under 1400 rapid on chess.com and 1675 rapid on Lee chess and you're studying a decent amount of chess, you should definitely email empirical period chess at gmail.com of course i'll also put that in the show description but if it sounds like something you might be interested in participating in then please do reach out because this could really help us learn more about exactly what works with studying chess which is a great service to the community of course number three the proverbial personal news i am excited to announce i'm going to start offering adult zoom chess classes at least one class per week i've been fleshing out the details in my mind for a while now and waiting for my family to be done moving so i could launch this we're actually not moving till the end of the month so i'm going to launch it in early october we are going to call it the perpetual chess happy hour uh, the idea will it will be for it to be fun and relaxing after a long day's work. But of course, I also want to help your chess. I prepare hard for everything I do and I'll prepare for this. Um, the recommended rating is under 1700 or so. I would say 1000 to 1700 is kind of the ideal range, but anyone interested can come check it out. The format of the class is going to be we're going to talk about a different player each week and we're going to do a little bio quick and then we're going to look at puzzles from the players, but it's not going to be all tactics. So it'll be tactics puzzles, positional puzzles, and then what they call in Woodpecker the red herring puzzles where I might show you a position and there is no best move and then we'll talk about them and that'll be the first half to two thirds of the class. Then we'll do a little Q&A about whatever you want and maybe play some Blitz at the end or something like that. So I'm really looking forward to it. I do a lot of school elastic classes and i think this will be a nice break for me and a nice way to get to know more people from the chess improvement community and i'd like to also try to mimic the business model i use for perpetual chess i'm so gratified that i'm able to do this podcast on what is primarily a donation driven basis thank you so much to everyone that supports and has supported the show Um, i'm gonna try the same thing for these classes so rather than have it be like sign up in advance, pay a certain amount. I'm just going to have basically a tip jar. There will be, it'll be 75 minute classes. The suggested donation will be five to $20, but if money's tight, you don't have to pay. If you're feeling generous, you could pay more, whatever the case may be, but I just want to try it like that. And if that's viable, we will keep it that way. So Pretty excited about that. If you're interested, again, it's not going to launch till October. So the only thing you need to do right now is go to perpetualchesspod.com slash happy hour and submit your name and email address. And of course, I'll link to that in the show description for you to click through. If you're interested, you guys may know something about me, may not. I'm a USCF master, although I have to confess my reading has fallen under 2200. It's something that I'm working on every day. But I'm a reasonably strong player. I've been trained to teach the steps method. I've taught chess for many, many years. And obviously, just conducting these interviews for four years, I've also tipped 
picked up a lot of tips and tricks, and I hope to learn from these classes as well through all of the preparation I will be doing for them to make them as succinct and enjoyable as possible. So I hope I covered all the details, but if there's anything you're wondering, uh, go to perpetualchesspod.com slash happy hour. And of course, you can always send me an email or hit me in the Perpetual Chess Facebook group or on Twitter with any questions you may have. But we're shooting for starting for it being Thursday nights in October, and then we'll see how things go. Okay. Apologies for the long winded introduction, but this is just stuff we've been wanting to to let you guys know about for a while now, but now we're going to get into the two-part Adult Improver Reunion, and we're going to kick things off with Andres Crisdois, so stay tuned and you can hear what is new in that interview. Hey everyone, here we are at Perpetual Chess with an, a follow-up interview with the original Adult Improver. Um, without this person, this this format of interview might not even exist. It was his inspiring story that made me realize I should be talking to adults who are doing tremendous things over the board. Um, at the time that I talked to him, this our first interview, for those who didn't hear it or would like to re-listen, was, came out on June 3rd, 2018. It's episode 76. Um, and he had just gotten an IM norm with like a 27, 2579 performance rating. Um, and just, just an incredible feat, uh, has a small business, um, has a family. So all of the things that, that uh, inhibit the growth of a lot of us chess players, myself included, but it, it was not holding him back. And he's still going strong, but we're going to let him give the update. So let's bring him in. Andres Shivda, how are you? Hello, I'm happy to be back. So thank you. <laughs> and thanks for the introduction. Sure. Yeah. Time flies, huh? Two years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I didn't think it was already two years. <laughs> it was like, yesterday. yeah. So, so we'll get a chess update momentarily, but we were just talking for a minute um, before we hit record. Uh, everything okay with your family, uh, health wise and life wise? Yes, it's okay. Thank you. Good. Glad to hear it. Yeah. Um, obviously, these are unusual times here. We're, we're recording in late August 2020. Um, but but let's cut to the chase, Andres. What's new with your chess? How's everything been going? Um, so I'm playing very actively and I'm enjoying this quite a lot. Um, obviously, there was a break during the, the lockdown. And uh, just last this month, I played two tournaments because things went started to come, come back in Poland. Um, yeah, so the last two years, uh, chess-wise, it was lots of play, le- lots of playing. But after my successes two years ago, meaning the um, international master norm, I wasn't really back to this. Um, I wasn't really close to another uh, international norm. Uh, actually, my rating um, af- uh, shortly after the interview we've made um, two years ago, I was very close to twenty-three hundred. I was twenty-two ninety-six at some point. And then I uh, quickly come back to 2200, and then I stayed in, at the level of 2200. Now I'm actually closer to 2100, so <laughs> things are going downhill in rating wise. Uh, but I'm, fi- I still think I'm improving, <laughs> and yeah. even though the results are not always great, um, I'm enjoying it. And it's like I don't know two or three tournaments which are not great or terrible, and then suddenly there is a really good tournament once in a while. So. I'm enjoying those successes uh, you know, when they happen. Yeah, it's so and you, it's so crazy how variant one's performance in a given tournament can be, and especially for someone like you who's playing a lot. And I will say, I'm not saying that it's true, but when we did our first interview, you did say you sort of felt like maybe it was like too much too soon. You know, yeah. like you had just had this huge run of success and you weren't totally sure if it was justified, but the results were that they were. And um, just as you can have some positive variance in chess, sometimes you have some negative variance. But as you well know, when you put in the work over time, uh, good things might happen when you least suspect them. Um, so I wouldn't. I'm glad to hear that you're still grinding away. As you're so again, we're going to be following up. So hopefully, a lot of listeners will remember a lot of the details from our first interview. But Andres is someone who recommended. He was a big fan of Kasparov's games. His favorite player recommended Kasparov on Kasparov, did a lot of chess studies. He was one of the, I mean, obviously the first adult improver interview, but someone who really emphasized the importance of us um, working parents, working on our calculation, um, being being vigilant about that. Is that still generally how you're approaching chess? And are you still finding the same time to study in addition to the time to play? 
I think I'm less disciplined in terms of how I do my trainings now. Uh, so I do, for example, the last year, I definitely did less endgame studies. And whenever I do them, things are going well. When I don't do them, they are going worse. <laughs> so I, I see, I, I'm trying to watch myself. Uh, I don't really, I'm not a metric oriented person, but I see what, what seems to be influencing my game or what doesn't. And I think doing endgame studies when I do them more, they think I think it's it's, it's better for me. Uh, I still enjoy Kasparov, so Kasparov is my main source of inspirations, um, and his series of Kasparov and Kasparov is still my favorite series. Um, I still enjoy working on openings. So, uh, I, but again, for example, uh, since two years ago, probably I work less on openings. And I see some, I think there is a correlation. So I think I should focus more on openings now, especially that I play quite often with, you know, very talented juniors who are well prepared. Um, one thing which is, uh, which I'm enjoying really a lot uh, is that I'm in my really good physical shape. So I'm in a good uh, shape right now. And it's all thanks to chess. Like I wouldn't start doing more sport, gym and uh, stuff like that without chess. So I, I owe this to chess that I'm I, I'm feeling better now. Yeah, I can see Andres on the camera, and I actually almost said something. You're looking like tanned and fit, so congratulations. Wish <laughs> I could you. say the same. <laughs> Thank you. That that's pretty cool, and that of course that's more important than anything. So so good for you. Are you, are you still riding a bicycle? I believe that was your exercise of choice when we last talked. Yeah, yeah, it's still bicycle. Now it's more gym, and I started doing the Thai box. Um, so I started training more uh, with, a, with, with a personal trainer. So yeah, it's, it's really, on, on this side of things, it's really much, much better. That's good to hear. And so with your games, your results haven't been where they want. You feel like you're still getting better overall. But when you pick apart your games, as I'm sure you do, when you analyze what's happening, is there sort of a thread that runs through them as something that's going wrong? Or do you just feel like the results aren't falling into place? There is no like one aspect I would say from from my analysis, and we, I work I still work with the same coach, so th this thing didn't change. So with Bartosz Sochko, um, and I think I improved in terms of my style. So I'm trying, I'm getting more aggressive, uh, more than I was uh, two years ago. Um, but I'm still not precise in calculation and in you know getting the initiative to attack and then getting the attack to actually convert to a win. So I lose many points by you know, not being precise in this phase. Um, I was experimenting. So two years ago, when I had my peak in terms of the result and the rating, I actually started changing everything in terms of openings. So I started playing d4 instead of e4 without really much preparation. And I started playing Karakan instead of Sicilian. Uh, so I used to play Scheveningen mostly. And now I play mostly Karakan. Uh, so there were some changes. And it took me quite a big time to actually not getting worse results. So some of my really terrible tournaments were actually a result of openings. So uh, I, I, I constantly remind myself that I need to work on openings. I actually enjoy openings. But I need to force myself sometimes to you know, work on those long variations. Um, I came back to chess ball recently after a while. Um, um, what else? I, I think it's um, there is also you know, when you play chess and you spend like four or five hours on a game, on, um, then I think your mental preparation is important. So you have to have a clear mind. And I think I, I, I have sometimes problems with that. So I start to think whatever is happening in my life, in my business and so on. So sometimes I find it difficult to focus on the game actually. Uh, and this, uh, you know, this means I lack concentration and sometimes it means I, I blunder. Uh, but overall, the number of blunders is not high. So this is not the main problem. And it, I was trying in many ways to detect what is the main issue, but there are just many small issues, I would say. And they're probably typical to what others see in their games as well. So sometimes it's an oversight. Sometimes it's a bad visualization of the final position. Or sometimes it's a good visualization, but bad you know, evaluation of the position. So I see the position from, from far, but I evaluate it uh, you know, wrongly. And this is, this is leading to problems. Um, sometimes it's myself being too creative with the openings. So it's like 
just recently I, I was like I was preparing for a game and I was playing planning to, to play in Inso with Black, but then suddenly in the game I thought, wow, this is a great moment to play King's Indian without any preparation. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> but actually I won. So that was maybe a good idea. Uh, I won, but I think the choice was good, King's Indian, because the the, the, the opponent is the type of player who doesn't like King's Indian you know, structures, but I didn't really know that, so it was by accident. But now I want to incorporate more of this psychological uh, preparation. So I want to prepare against my opponents more than preparing for myself. Um, this is something I need to, I, I want to improve. Yeah, as I recall, you managed to play in a lot of tournaments that are maybe, the, I don't know if they're strictly invitational, but where Poland is, uh, you know, not a huge country. So I feel like it's a relatively small player base and you can, you can do some good prep for some people. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. And Poland has um, this right, right now in Poland, we have this nice wave of you know, young people coming to the chess world. There are many good uh, chess coaches. So there is like a constant wave of new uh, juniors um, and, Playing against them, you know, they are like 20, 25 years younger than me. Um, this is something I can I can prepare for those juniors. Like I play with them very often for with the, against the same juniors. Uh, at the same time, they are very often underrated. So I, I see big rating losses on my side when I play against those juniors, for example. So one tip maybe is to avoid playing against. Yeah, people. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. it, it's hard to avoid because it, like in Poland, uh, um, when I go to tournaments, uh, usually there are juniors there, right? So they have time and uh, they are they are preparing for their championships and so on. So uh, this is very, very often. Yeah, and it's tough because I don't know how it works in Poland, but here in the U.S., some tournaments are USCF rated and some tournaments are also are USCF and FIDE rated. Mm -hmm. And the, the juniors, often their FIDE rating has not caught up with their chest strength. So if you're being judged by your free day rating, it can be cruel. Every time you play, you you know, you might play some kid who's 1900 free day, but 2200 and rising USCF. And it's just like, oh, God, you know, <laughs> like, so does that sort of thing happen in Poland, too? We only have a uh, feeder rating and almost every tournament is, is feeder rated. So um, but it, it, it's similar in the case that, OK, I, I, two weeks ago, I played in Wrocław in a classic tournament and I played mostly against uh, 1800, 1900 or 2000 players. And I, I almost I, I've had really big at the beginning of the tournament, like the first five rounds, I wasn't able to beat them. I've had draws and I actually lost against some 2100 player two, two again, two, two losses against 2100 players. And so some draws against 1800 players where, where a draw was actually lucky on my side. Um, and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that those uh, young people, they will be 2200, uh, like in one year from now. So they are still underrated and I lost 30 rating points just in this one tournament. So it was painful, but you know, this is, this is something that I sign up for when I sign up for this kind of tournament. I know that I will lose rating. Yeah, it's all part of the the growth process, hopefully. And you mentioned that you still work with Grandmaster Sako. What what does he say when you show him your games? What's what's the feedback you're getting? Um, it's changed over the last two years, for example, where we were focusing on getting more active style of playing on my side, and I, he's saying now good words about it. So uh, he he says I'm playing very actively and aggressively in my games. Um, maybe too creative in the openings sometimes on my side. Um, uh, he, he says his approach of having a calm repertoire, but being active and aggressive after the opening phase. And I'm just like, sometimes I'm not too patient and I, I try to complicate things in the opening. Mm, I think uh, he suggested I should do more endgame studies now, for example. So he sees the problems with calculation uh, in my game. Uh, also the, the whole mental approach. So being really ready for, for a game, yeah. which, is, which is hard, like when you're adult and you have a family, you have business and so on. And, you know, the whole world is burning and now you have, you want to. <laughs> yeah. <it>, so. Amen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sometimes I feel like if I, I haven't, I haven't played tournaments in a long time, um, but I was actually starting to gear up right when the coronavirus hit. And even when I when I was playing as an active adult, uh, I had a little period a couple years back. And yeah, I often would feel like, especially the early rounds of a tournament, it would take me like half an hour to get into the headspace of like, okay, I'm actually just thinking about this game. Um, and then once that happens, it's kind of a magical feeling because it's nice that you everything that you're always thinking about, you stop thinking about. It. It's kind of meditative, but it, you don't you can't just flip it on and off. I find. 
Exactly. Uh, I see it as a meditation in a way. Uh, so when I start playing the classical game, which is like four hours or five hours, and I see this, you know, this thought coming to my mind, which is not chess related, and I try to note this note, uh, you know, put it aside. But also yeah. when I finish the game and I go back to my room, uh, I actually see that, okay, this is maybe the biggest problem now, which I have in the business right now, because th why is this thought coming to my mind? Like maybe it's, maybe it's from my business, uh, you know, life right so so i try to detect this and then it's helping me to fix those problems so in a way chess is helping me in my in my business life as well of or whether it's coming maybe from personal life then I, I see it like a way of meditation but obviously i don't want to have it like this i want to focus on chess and just yeah. don't, don't be disturbed by that uh, which is i think a long process of you know getting this clear mind so meditation helps uh, i think sport helps so usually when i have a you know bad start of the tournament um, I tried to go somewhere and get physically exhausted. Like I started playing well last week after the, the tournament started badly for me. When I went hiking for a, you know, the whole first half of the day hiking, a uh, really exhausting trip. And then I came back and started playing chess almost without preparation, but I won. So right. it was like helping me, um, I don't know, mentally or psychologically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there have been studies that show that just just going for a walk in the woods is like good for your brain. Um, so, what's your? You mentioned meditation, like actual meditation, not just the meditative process of uh, immersing yourself in chess. What What's your approach? Are you, Are you someone who does it in a regimented manner, or just sort of dabbles? Um, I'm not a really well organized person overall, so. Um... All kinds of like habits or something that I know that are good for me, they're not coming very easy for me. So meditations I consider a really good thing, and I also took this habit from many of your guests when I when they when they talk about, you know, what they do as as part of you know the mental preparation for chess. Many of your guests say about med meditation. So uh, I, I'm trying to do it, but it's more like in waves. So sometimes there are months where I do meditation almost every day, but then there are months where I just stop it and f for some reason I don't do it. Uh, so maybe I should be more disciplined about it. Uh, sometimes during tournaments, I do it like when I see that my mind is occupied with other things and I want to focus on chess. Sometimes like one hour before the actual game, I meditate for 10 minutes at least and then uh, you know, try to clear my mind this way. Yeah. I mean, for listeners who have never tried meditation, once you've committed several months, um, it could be months, it could be longer, it could be shorter, but something in that neighborhood to it and you've sort of developed the process. That is one nice thing about it as someone who used to meditate a lot and hasn't been doing it lately. But if something's ever particularly stressful or if the opportunity ever arises or whatever it may be, it's nice that the, the sort of muscle memory is there where you can feel the benefit. Whereas some people, when they're trying to get into it, they're just sort of sitting there and they're like, why, why am I wasting my time? You know? Mm -hmm. Um, so you, of course you've mentioned, you've had a bit of, uh, you know, the over the board results haven't been the way that they wanted. And, um, as we were discussing before we recorded, that's something that every chess player deals with from time to time, but how are you like, does this take a toll on you psychologically or do you find it super frustrating or are you feel like you're able to sort of have the big picture perspective? I'm looking at this as a marathon, as a, as a, as a sprint. So obviously I do, I am like sad after a tournament and, you know, it's not always great to talk to me when the tournament finishes and I, I didn't finish very well. Uh, but overall, I, I am staying calm. So I enjoy, I enjoy the process. I trust the process. Uh, I'm trying to think less about rating, maybe even not like two years ago, I was definitely more focused on rating than I am now. Uh, now it's more like enjoying the chess, enjoying the game, enjoying the process of learning and improving, even if the results are not great. And two years ago, I was probably more, um, I was better at picking those tournaments, which could promise me some rating points. And I avoided those junior tournaments, for example. Right now, I don't care. I just want to play and I want to, like, by playing, I want to become better. Um, I play a lot, lots of rapids and blisses. And in those types of games, I, I get some good results uh, recently. So whenever a classical game is not going well, the rapid will somehow compensate. So, I'm, for example, with FIDE, most of the players are have bigger uh, classical rating than rap rapid. And from September, I will have the opposite. So I will have the rapid rating being uh, bigger. I think I will have like 2160 and, uh, in rapid and 2120 in classic. Mm. So 
I, I'm I'm I don't I'm not like super sad. I'm very very happy with where I am uh, right now. So I've had those um, big successes, and I I've, I'm pretty sure there will be more successes along the way. Uh, so I'm just trusting that you know this will happen. Good, good to hear. Yeah, and I look forward to hearing about those successes in in the future. Although we're not done yet, mm -hmm. a couple more questions for you, Andres. So one of them is from a Patreon supporter, Daylin Shelton, who I'll be asking. Um, all three of the guests that I'm catching up with in this interview. Um, he asks, he says, I am a fellow adult improver who has slowly improved over the course of five years. My, questions is, my question is, do you ever get burnt out from chess? And if so, what tips have you found helpful to keep your studies up when you feel less motivated to study or play? It's funny because man, um, given my recent bad results, I've been asked by some chess friends quite a lot whether I burned out, or, uh -huh. but I wasn't. Like it never happened to me. I, I just enjoy this game so much. It's just I can't imagine being you no know, mad at this game, or or I never was close to the decision that okay, maybe it's enough. Maybe I should stop it. Maybe, maybe I should give up on my goals. Uh, I constantly like reevaluate my goals. I reevaluate my process of getting to those goals. But I'm I was never close to giving up, and I'm a I'm not really sure what is hap what is helping me in this approach. Like I have really great support from my wife, from my family. Um, many people are supporting me. I you know even in my business, I the whole team is is there to to, to run the company where I'm playing chess. So it's sure. amazing. It's like everyone is there helping me, and I think I owe them this. Like I should <laughs> I just should continue. Like everyone is is helping me in so many ways. Um, so I don't know what, what what might be the tip. I just you know I okay maybe there's one tip which I learned from from another like part of my life which is write down your successes and whenever uh, whenever something bad is happening which is quite often in my case in when when I play classic classical chess recently uh, then I just remind myself okay Andrew you played very well two years ago you 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 are able to have twenty five. Uh, 100 rating performers or even more you've beaten this grandmaster you 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 won against this this grandmaster right so uh you drew with david navara uh, so i just wow. remind myself uh, that there were good good games good results and they will be back because there is like i don't believe i'm at this okay i'm 40 this year but i i don't believe all those <laughs> researches that they will tell me that my brain is not working and then <laughs> working worse or something like that i think i'm, I'm getting better <laughs> so <laughs> maybe That's against great. maybe against some research but I, I feel like it's getting it's really getting well overall and um i've i've also done like re result wise or you know result oriented approach in my case it didn't work very well because i've done so many things which were like against results like exchanging the, rep the openings repertoire you know picking the the, the tournaments uh for some reason, I dropped like uh, endgame studies and chess ball for a while. So I was just experimenting maybe too much in some in, in so, at some points. Um, but overall, I'm like uh, I think you know I'm still on a good path. <laughs> okay, yeah, good advice. And Dalen, uh, you Dalen, you might have heard the interview with uh, another adult improver, Philemon Thomas, where he talked a lot about having had he was he's been grinding, grinding, grinding for like a decade, but he said he took many breaks in there. Like whenever it just becomes a burden, you take a break. And you mentioned our friends at Chessable, Andres, you were one of the early adopters talking about it a lot in our previous interview. Um, if you have a Chessable streak, just do the one puzzle a day, you know, just just uh, do the do the one opening line or one puzzle a day just to remember that it's there and try to keep that going. But yeah, I mean, if it's not fun, then then it makes sense to step away in my my opinion um so last topic for you andres is just uh it's been two years obviously the chess content is a never-ending tidal wave um we've got the the twitch streamers all the great video content chessable all these great authors have you had any new discoveries or just general revelations about chess since we last spoke uh, yes, uh, <laughs> there, there is like a, one year ago I went to Abu Dhabi and I played a tournament there in Emirates and uh, I was really badly beaten by all those young Indian players who arrived to this tournament, like half of the uh, starting list was actually Indian players and they were playing so good chess and I started investigating what is going on in India and obviously I, I watched everything about Ramesh. Uh, I figured that's where this was going. <laughs> and I bought the, the subscription to 365 Chess Academy. 
and it's amazing. Like I mostly like there's so many videos there. Uh, every week there are new videos coming. I focus mostly on Ramesh, and I, I can see why why is this country so so great at chess. Um, so this is my probably main source of content which I'm consuming. So I'm not watching all those streamers, but when a new, when an interesting tournament is happening, I obviously I try to watch the Carson games or Nakamura games. Um, but three 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 six five chess academy is probably the the main uh, new thing in my like repertoire of you know things which are which I can watch. Uh, I still recommend Chessable to everyone. Um, I use oh, but this is uh, this, I started using because I use Mac instead of Windows. I use uh, Hiarx Chess Explorer for as a as a, my main database tool, and uh, this, the people be, the team behind it is really great. So I recommend Hiarx. Uh, now as, as the chess database um, tool, um, and I'm I'm still a subscriber to Chess Publishing, so I receive their opening novelties every uh, like almost every week. Um, yeah, I think that's yeah, it. I haven't, yep. I haven't pulled the trigger on Chess Publishing yet. I know that Kevin Go, who was recently on the show, writes for them. John Hartman's a big fan of theirs. I heard that you also mentioned them two years ago. I've been trying to clean up my opening repertoire, and I feel like once it's once it's like somewhat okay then i can think about new stuff but right now i still feel like i'm like chasing the bus down the street trying to catch up you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's it's very hard with the openings like I, I i for example now i can be proud to say that two years ago i was only e4 player and now i can play both so i'm really yeah that's huge this is huge for me and on the black side i can play sicilian and Karakan. i still don't have this good alternatives for d4 so i mostly need so but King's Indian is coming, uh, so I'm, oh, a big, good. I'm a big fan of Kamil Plichta, uh, my my good friend. Yeah, yeah, good guy. Been on yeah, the show, of course. He, he's all, always, um, uh, you know, influencing my openings and uh, inspiring me with new ideas. So I, I always, you know, whatever cl course on, on chessable arrives from Kamil, I always buy it. Excellent, cool. Well, thanks, Andres. This has been a lot of fun. Um, I, so just to follow up, any sort of over the board revelations, any like truth you feel like you've discovered about chess that you didn't know two years ago? I'm putting you on the spot here, so it's okay <laughs> to, uh, to to punt. <laughs> no, it's just I would repeat the same. D don't play against juniors if you want to have results. <laughs> yeah, but like you say, I mean, it's probably better to invest in the process. You know, like yeah. if you ever decide you want to chase rating again, you could take all the lessons you've learned from the those juniors and yeah. put it and then avoid them you know but, yeah. but in the meantime it'll help your overall game yeah yeah I'm, I'm really thankful for everything that is happening in my life thanks to chess i was traveling so much over the last years uh i visited so many new countries for for me uh so it was amazing and i really like um and, and thank by the way two years ago when we had this interview i've had so many people contacted me directly and they were supporting me and they are still supporting me uh, i still the, my Facebook page is a bit less active, but I, I see all the people reacting to my updates. So I just want to thank you, uh, thanks to say thanks to everyone because it is it's amazing to have the support from the community. Yeah, it is, and you're 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 still one of the most popular adult improver interviews. And I when I re-listened to it, getting ready for this follow up, I could see why. Just a lot of insight, and it's a great story. So so stick with it, Andres, and uh, hopefully we can catch up again in a in a couple more years. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Perpetual Chess listeners, you're in for a treat this week, as Chessable.com has released a free course by none other than Grandmaster Yasser Sarawan. These days, Yaz is best known as one of the best announcers in the business, but he was also a fierce over-the-board competitor who crossed swords with Kasparov, Karpov, and many others, and lived to write some great books. One of them is Winning Chess Strategies, which is now being adapted for Chessable.com. And again, the first section is available for free if you go to their website site and of course it has their move trainer technology to help you remember everything that you learn it has a 19 minute video so it's one of the many things you can and should check out at chessable.com okay on to stacia pew Okay, and we are here with Stacia Pugh. She was a wonderful guest in August of 2018, an accomplished adult improver who at the time had gained 300 points or so in the prior year to bring her rating to the high 1700s. Uh, we discussed that at length in, this, in our prior interview, which I'll link to and I recommend you guys listen to uh, before you check this one out. But if you just want the cliff notes, um, Stacia is also a professional cornhole player, but she had also been 
um, working for a nonprofit. She was transitioning to chess full time, which I believe she has pulled off. Also, an evident love for chess, um, as shown in her results, but also just her general enthusiasm in terms of improvement. She gave us a nice top 10 list that we'll dig into. She's an advocate of flashcards, and we're going to talk about all that stuff in our little update. But first, let's bring her in. So Stacia Pugh, how are you? I'm doing well, Ben. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, can we were just saying, can you believe it's been two years? It, it doesn't feel like it to me. No, not at all. That flew by. Time flies yeah. when you're having fun. Which is funny because right now during the uh, Corona lockdown, every day is a huge drag. But st- but still, uh, two, it doesn't feel like it's been two years nonetheless. Um, so Stacia, so you're doing chess full time now, correct? Yes, I sure am. How's that treating you? Um, it's been a wild and amazing ride. Um, I even so I left. I actually pulled up on Facebook today, and it was this exact day two years ago that I left my job and my career as a real estate developer for a nonprofit. (laughs) So exactly two years today. And um, I wanted to be like pro cornhole and, you know, chess professional working in chess, not uh, master strength. (laughs) And um, so, but since then I actually left cornhole as well. So I am all chess now. Wow. And how, how is it treating you? Are you, are you tired of it yet? Uh, no, not at all. I'm like obsessed with it. (laughs) Um, I mean, but I guess I've sort of added this component of teaching kids to my chess, um, which was a smaller part of my life before. And now it's growing larger. And surprisingly to me, I actually really enjoy teaching chess to kids. So it's been, that part has been really great. And I feel like it sort of reinforces um, my efforts to become a stronger player as well. That's cool. And um, yeah, and like I, I left cornhole, you know, which was kind of a tough decision, but I felt like I wanted to for kind of a long time. And, um, you know, I, I just believe that you should follow your heart in life. I mean, if you're if you're not following heart, then, your heart, then what are you doing? <laughs> well said. Yeah. And, and I'm glad to hear that you're still enjoying it. And yeah, I kind of sense that I re-listened to our old interview and I kind of sensed um, that that you might be phasing out cornhole as chess took a increasingly prominent place in your life. Uh, interesting. I'm predictable. <laughs> I, no, I wouldn't say that. But I mean, like you say, I mean, it's two years. So I, I'm, I think it's fair to say that you were considering it at that point. Like you said, you were thinking about it for a while. Yeah, I'd say that's fair. Like Cornhole was kind of like, hey, I'm good at this. Maybe I should keep doing this. So yeah. I, I wanted to get on ESPN. That actually did happen. I was aired on ESPN 30 something times. Um, and the the leading cornhole organization actually flew me to New York City a couple times to do like inner like showings on shows and um, walk around in my jersey and sign autographs and stuff. It was kind of a crazy time. Definitely different. <laughs> yeah. Um, and chess, of course, a great substitute, as they say, when you're trying to replace something, it's like you're trying to replace a bad habit. You need a new habit to take its place. And you know, chess being the ultimate habit. But but Stacia, let's uh let's get an update on the actual chess. So of course, this is a strange time to be recording this in a sense because all of us are unable to play OTB tournaments or at least have been since March or so here in the US. But what's what's been the general tra- trajectory of your chess competing since uh in the past two years? Yeah, my story is probably different than a lot of people. Um So what happened is shortly after our interview and my rise to 1791 USCF, um, I started working for Progressive Chess, a nonprofit chess organization, and it's run by National Master Michael Jolson. Now, National Master Michael Jolson is a longtime student of International Master Calvin Blocker. So I don't know if you've heard of him. Oh, yeah. Um, But... He also, um, he kind of has his own school of chess and it's very Morphe-esque and it's very, um, you know, play 1E4, learn the open game, only then play 1D4. I know Mark Esserman uh, has come up in this school of chess 
and probably several others. I don't really know. But um, so working with Michael Jolson, I was like, okay, this is my chance to, you know, embrace this school of chess and sort of let go of what I've learned so far and learn something totally different. So I was a 1D4 player and I was playing closed and as safe as possible chess, you know, like win a pawn, win the pawn up and ending, like that kind of chess. Right. <laughs> and Michael Jolson is like, no, you're not doing that anymore. Like you have a lack of found chess foundation is basically what he said to me. Um, and he said, you should work with Kevin Blocker. So I started, I hired uh, Kevin Blocker as my chess tra trainer. And um, so I had to, even though I was at 1791 USCF and I was like, I had the mentality of, okay, I just want to hold on to my rating for a while. You know, I just want to hold on to this for a minute. And they're like, no, 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 no. You're starting over. <laughs> huh. Yeah. Like square one, one E four, like all the chess theory I learned went out the window over three years. And yes, I did rely on that quite a bit. And um, so I started playing not only one E four, but they're like, yeah, you're going to play all gambits, King's gambit, Smith Mora gambit. <laughs> you know, I'm like, what? <laughs> so, uh, but you know what? I think that, um, I'm the type of person that is kind of intrigued by change. I guess that's kind of evidenced by me leaving my entire old life and doing this. Right. <laughs> and so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to embrace this and I'm going to do exactly what these strong players tell me to do. You know, it worked for Mark Esserman. So um, I did that. And as you might expect, I had a huge crash, huge crash. I hit my rating floor which was 1500. It was a bit depressing. And, um, but I knew from cornhole even that you're going to have ups and downs in the improvement process. And so I was okay with it. You know, I'm like, I'm going to go through a slump, but I'm going to learn and become a better, more well-rounded player. And when I come out the other side of this, I'll be able to play one D4 or one E4. I'll be able to play open game. I'll be able to play closed game. So these are all attributes that grandmasters have, right? So um, I think in the long run, this is really going to benefit me. But I had that crash. Okay, so dealing with that was hard and a little depressing, but I knew that I just have to stick with it and continue my studies. So I did that. And I think I sat at my floor for maybe five months at one point. So that was very hard to swallow, but I stuck with 1E4. I stuck with the gambits. And now I've, I managed to raise my rating back up. Um, of course, like in March, it got frozen. Right. <laughs> so I, I think my technical USCF rating is 1660 at the moment, but I have gotten my Lee Chess rating. It doesn't mean much, but it, that's at 1950. My Lee Chess classical is 1900. And I do feel that you know, I could definitely reach the rating I was at now with this completely new style of play, like playing with the initiative, sacrificing material, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and now I feel like I'm ready to go back over the board and prove that I'm a better chess player. But alas, COVID-19. Yeah. Well, no, no end in sight here in the U.S. Right, right. So I'm, I take my online game serious. Mm. I mean, I know we chatted before this interview and you don't really do that. I do take them very serious, as serious as possible. So that helps me um, stay focused during this time. Um, and I do study every single morning for about an hour. And, um, and so I'm doing a lot of things. I'm still just as on fire for chess than ever, probably more so than before even. So awesome. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the challenge of, you know, especially breaking 2000. Um, the one encouraging thing I've had recently is I played the world open uh, women's championship. It was online. Right. Um, but I went ahead and played that on ICC and uh, that was a, a great experience. And I, I did play an expert and got my first draw against, against an expert. 
So okay. Hey. Nice I'll celebrate the small wins when I can get them, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hope a draw, like in a worse ending. Um, I, it was queen versus knight and rook, and I held a draw there. So that was nice. Um, Excellent. I was off the two pawns down. Um, yeah. So I just want to add a few notes, Stacia. Number one, you've written about this switch to E4, which I do find interesting. Um, one thing I just wanted to follow up on, just because I'm curious. Um, so I am Mark Esselman, who you mentioned, um, who does some Twitch streaming and, of course, wrote Mayhem and the Mora. Um, is he from Ohio? Because I know that I am Calvin Blocker and the aforementioned uh, and um, Michael Jolson um, are. are. Yeah, I actually don't know, but he must be. I mean, okay. my guess is yes, but I... You cannot quote me on that, but yeah. okay. Well, I'm afraid you might get quoted, but but anyway, we'll <laughs> we'll, we'll be forgiving if uh, if it turns out not to be true. Wouldn't wouldn't be the first time. Um, I certainly have misspoken at times. Um, so, but yeah, we'll we'll figure that out. I was just curious, but yeah, the I mean, the idea I think is interesting, and again, you do provide a little more insight on why your coach felt that this was the best course of action for you, and he even did a little guest post. Um, where he talked about it. But yeah, basically his idea was just like, you need to learn to play dynamic positions. So I sort of inferred from that, that it's not it's not about E4 per se. It's about like guaranteeing that you don't just become a sort of one dimensional player. Do, do you think that's a fair judgment? Yeah, I think that's accurate. And, you know, I think they also wanted to take the leg out of me standing on some, you know, memorized like opening theory and just have me play chess on my own. Um, even in the opening. So yeah, so, I think I've gotten so much out of this experience. Yeah, I can't say my rating is going to prove that it's paid off yet. But I do believe that in the long run, it will pay off. Yeah, well, like we corresponded a bit via email. I mean, there's just as an adult, like as a kid, somehow for kids, it can happen that your rating just kind of goes up in a straight line, or maybe you flatline for a little bit, but you don't really see these big dips. But as an adult, it's mm -hmm. just totally normal to have these like 200 point swings. Um, and so much of it is just because chess is a performance activity. So it's not necessarily just about knowledge. It's about execution. Um, and uh, as adults with a lot of responsibilities that can, that can be all over the place. And it's not, not necessarily indicative of you like forgetting something that you already knew, or that's what I tell myself about my, uh, my reading having fallen from its heights at least. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, but I did want to just just for the sake of um, understanding, and again, this is something that we all go through. But so when you when you had this sort of downdraft in your rating that took you to your rating floor, a rating floor, by the way, is like at some point as your rating goes higher for for people who aren't familiar with them, that's uh, the lowest possible rating you have gets raised. And that's just a rule that's in place, at least here in the U.S., so that people can't do what's called sandbagging where they lose points on purpose. I know you would never do that, Stacia, but. But just just to clarify what a rating floor is. So what was happening in the games? Were you losing out of the opening or were you just struggling in the middle game with the open positions as your coaches sort of predicted? Or what, what was the pattern when you looked at the, the games from your slump? Yeah, all of that and more. Maybe the biggest factor. OK, I got caught in the opening a couple times for sure. Um, but probably the biggest factor is that in these foreign positions where I didn't know the typical plans, um, I was burning a lot of time. So I lost a lot of games where I just had a huge time deficit compared to my D4 repertoire that I knew up and down and back and forth. And I could blitz out the first, you know, 12 to 14 moves of theory and, uh, and then know the position and kind of what I have to do. And so I think that time deficit was the biggest factor. Yeah, that's a big deal. And and when we last talked, you were saying you were playing a lot of sort of the one night tournaments where it's like three game thirties or whatever it may be. Is that is that where this was happening or was it slower time controls or or both? Um, it was both, but mostly rapid. So mostly yeah. 30 minute. Yeah. Yeah. For those faster time controls, knowing your openings is is so helpful. Un mm -hmm. underrated. Um yeah, so so again, totally understandable. And I did want to follow up on a couple of other things that you mentioned, just because I'm curious how how your thinking has evolved in the time. So in our last interview, as I mentioned in the intro, you you were a big advocate of flashcards, which 
funny enough, you were one of the first people kind of talking about this idea of space repetition that we talk about nearly every week now. And of course, that Chessable has built a business around um, in order to help you remember and assimilate patterns. Is that something you're still doing? Are you still doing a lot of flashcards or have you moved on from that, Stacia? I still believe in the flashcards. I can't say I'm doing them quite like I was before. And I've sort of gotten into this mode where I like to do what I call video flashcards, where it's like I make like a a two to four minute like video of a position that I thought was interesting that I didn't assess correctly or didn't find the correct continuation. And I do go through those. Um, so I still do believe in that. And I probably, it would probably serve me well to get back to that more as well. Um, but yeah, I guess, you know, I think it's fun. It's more fun to learn chess and switch up the stuff you do. So I'm not surprised that I moved on to some other. Yeah. So, so you're doing an hour per morning at least. And as a chess teacher, I'm sure, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg because chess is sort of always around when you teach chess for a living. Um, but what exactly are you general, like, what are you doing with that hour? What's your current approach? Yeah. So I try to stick to what I am, uh, Calvin blocker assigned to me, which was, he said to look at Morphe games. So I do that. Um, he said, do lots of tactics. So I do that. Um, he said to analyze your games. So I do that. And he uh, he said, cover to cover, do Art of Checkmate, the book. Oh, wow. Um, which is basically, you know, like attacking, like checkmating patterns and stuff, um, which I, I definitely am seeing in my own games now. So I think all that advice is great. I'm going to continue. Um, I mean, really, I've only been working with him like the last maybe nine months. Okay. Um, so I guess not all that long. But I'm definitely seeing a lot of that in my games already. And I also do like a monthly theme. So like I decide on a theme for my morning studies and then I stick to that theme for one month. So like one month was, you know, Bobby Fisher's games. So I analyzed those and went through those. This month I chose game analysis. So I'm going through my tournament games and really picking them apart in depth. Um, like spending like three or four hours per game. Great. Wow. Um, and, you know, before that was tactics puzzles. Um, so I just pick a theme every month. And I think I'm going to I'm going to have like a major piece ending theme pretty soon because I noticed that I have a lot to learn about major piece endings. <laughs> so, yeah, that sounds like like a pretty reasonable theme. Um, so when when you go through your games, are you able to treat i know you've been like you, you mentioned playing in the world open women section and, and as we were talking you you said you um you've still been playing some slower time control games online do you find that you're able to treat them as seriously as you would an actual over the board game i am yeah I, that's why i thought it was so interesting that you kind of mentioned uh, only blitz before the interview and uh yeah, but I, well let me hop in and explain just since uh <laughs> since, since sure. we're ref- no it's just since we're referencing it i was just saying Stacia and i were chatting a bit before we hit record and i was she was saying uh, i see that on twitter that that i've actually been working on my chest which is true but i was telling Stacia i've decided to kind of specialize in not specialize but emphasize blitz improvement just because for me i get immediate feedback right now which during covid you can't really get in classical chess and due to my family circumstances and kind of general uh, maybe lack of attention span, um, I can't, I just, I'm not going to schedule a 90 minute game to play with like unrated training game. Um, you know, it would have to be after my kids go to bed basically. And I'm, yeah, it's, it's just not happening. I would love to do it. Like if I were going to a tournament, um, and then the stakes feel real and then I could do it, but online I would struggle with that. But, but one other thing just to add from, from me, Stacia, I am treating the blitz seriously. Like I, I review every game. I have a rule. I review every game immediately after I play it. Um, I always look up the opening and my openings have been terrible for a long time. So for me, that's actually a very efficient way to finally sort of address openings. So I, I am treating it somewhat seriously, but yeah, I'm definitely emphasizing blitz over, like deep calculation right now. Yeah. And that's interesting to me because um, 
well, just as an adult improver, you know, I, I don't think the, my blitz helps me. Like, I think to really get like acquire more understanding of chess, I have to, to learn new things. So thinking more deeply about the position is important for me. And, um, I take my slower games very seriously. I even get like super nervous before the games. Like, my Oh, hands. cool. That's yeah. good. Like it feels very real to me. And, uh, I know that computer cheating is like a big deal with slow. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, but it doesn't bother me necessarily because I will still have a game that I can learn something from. Um, and I'm not like totally set on winning a tournament. I just want to play some, I just want to play chess, you know? So I wouldn't get, I don't get as upset about that as maybe a lot of people, but I've only had, I've only had um, one game since all this started one tournament game where um, my opponent did use computer assistance. So that's encouraging, you know, so it's not like it happens that much, I guess. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I play like this event on, it's called the, like the Tuesday tussle. I play in that and I played the Twitter chess league, which I thought was really beneficial for me. Um, yeah. And I take all that very serious. That's great. Yeah. I, I, I wish that I, was more able to do it, but I just find it, it just doesn't feel the same to me online. Whereas Blitz, um, it's fast enough where I can tune out the distraction for, you know, six to 10 minutes at a time. Um, <laughs> but, but anyway, let, but before we let you go from this update, Seisha, I did want to run through. So you did something pretty cool in our last interview where you gave me a, an actual bullet pointed top 10 list of uh, your improvement tips. And again, for listeners who haven't heard it, or maybe even if you did hear it, you might want to go back and listen um, just just to catch all of Stacia's advice. But I thought I might just read them to you quickly and see if there's any of them that that you would either like blatantly move up or move down the list, or if there's something that you would strike from the list, so on or so forth. So, um, okay. so uh, number 10, presumably this would be the... Tenth most important is openings choices should be chosen by someone else. Number nine is don't forget end games. Number eight is OTB and community will inspire you and keep your interest. So I guess at this point we're down to community on that one. Um, <laughs> no, number seven is patterns make you better. Number six, it's not about rating. It's about learning. That's a good one. Number five, teacher explain what you learn. You're doing that. Number four, tactics books with themes. Number three, work with a coach or stronger player. Number two, game analysis. Always learn from your mistakes. And number one, maintain balance between hard work and passion. So how does that uh, land with you two years later, Stacia? Yeah, I still love it. Yeah, that's... I do I too. I believe in it. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Yeah, you've got some real wisdom in that little list. Yeah, um, I think the only thing I would add is that if you have the opportunity um, to work with talented stronger players. Um, you know, I think a big mistake a lot of students do and kids do this too, is they don't listen. They don't listen to what they're being told. And, you know, I have to admit a big part of me when I was told to give up all my openings, did not want to do that because I knew it would hurt my game so much. But um, I think I'm going to come out on the other side with a whole lot not more knowledge and be um a well-rounded chess player, which on the trajectory that I was on, that would never happen. So that's, that's a great attitude, up. especially because it's not like you necessarily had instant gratification, you know, like you had that downdraft first where a lot of people might just grumble and be like, screw them. I knew it all along, you know, but, <laughs> but it sounds like you're, you're still invested in the process, which is good. Yeah. And I don't, and I don't want to like indicate either that I'm learning that I'm playing all gambits because I think that's the way to play chess. No, I'm learning a facet of the game that needs to be learned. It needs to be part of, of what I'm doing. Yeah. And when I'm done with that. I will know how to do it, but I will have choices. And I think, you know, if you want to be a strong player, you should be able to play chess in every way possible, not just be good at one way. That's how I feel. So that's my goal. Plus, I just love to learn. Excellent. 
Well, Stacia, I just have two more questions here in our little follow-up. Uh, number one is from a Patreon supporter. It's from Dalen Shelton, who asks, and I'm going to be asking this to all three of our returning guests. Uh, Dalen says, I'm a fellow adult improver who has slowly improved over the course of five years. But my question is, do you ever get burnt out from chess? And if so, what have you found helpful to keep your studies up when you feel less motivated to study or play? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I felt burnt out at times. I think the best thing to do when you feel burned out is take a break. You do not want to crush your passion for chess. Like I know people, some people will say grind through it, grind through it. But what I found, and I did this in cornhole, actually, I I was doing the grind, like I have to practice every day or I'm not going to improve. But then what happens is it will slowly crush your passion more and more. And once that is sufficiently crushed, you will never improve and you'll just end up quitting. So I think it's important to nurture the fun part of chess. So if you feel like you're burnt out, then switch things up, maybe take a break. Even a week off is totally fine. And let your love of the game drive you. That's Wow. Excellent. I like it. Poetic. Um, Okay. And the last thing, Stacia, is when, when I did interview two, two years ago, I asked you about your goals and you had mentioned sort of dream goal of making IM and more proximate goal um, of making master first, obviously make master before I am. So are those still your long-term goals or do you have something um, more updated or more um, immediate uh, uh, that you're prioritizing first? That's still my goal. I am very committed. I want to become an IM. I'm going to do everything in my power to uh, make that happen. Um, And my theory is that if I put all this effort and work into that and it doesn't happen, um, then that's okay because it will lead to something else. But there is a, a part of me that believes I can do it. So I'm going to try my best. <laughs> Excellent. That's the spirit. You uh, you have a great attitude. Um, okay. So Stacia, thank you for the update. Anything else before we let, we let you go? Um, I guess that's it. Just thank you for having me back. I really appreciate it. And I hope that I'll make a third appearance after I break 2000 or 2100. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's not about the results to me. I mean, I think it's, you know, people, I enjoy hearing people's stories. So I mean, once we've heard it, it's like you you want to get an update, you know? So yeah, I would be happy to in, in another couple of years. I mean, hopefully we'll both uh both still have our love for chess. I don't think uh I don't think it's going anywhere. Yeah, I don't think so either. For for either one of us. Okay, well thanks, Stacia. And I still have all your your info. You've got a great chess.com blog, you're on Twitter. Um, you can do some YouTube videos, so I'll link to all that stuff. Did I leave anything out? I think that covers it. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Well, continued success. And uh, yes, uh, wear a mask and be safe, Stacia. <laughs> okay. You as well. <laughs> Special thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy, And thanks to those who continue to help spread the word about Perpetual Chess. Positive reviews on podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts. Glowing comments on YouTube help people discover the show, as does telling a friend or, or sharing it on social media. Speaking of which, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Beneficial1, or join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group and continue the conversation about the latest interview. Sometimes the guests even weigh into these discussions. The Perpetual Chess Instagram page is back in action, so lots of ways to stay engaged, as they say. But most of all, of course, I want to thank those who provide financial support to the show, especially right now with all this COVID craziness going on in the world. Most of all, I want to thank Chessable for sponsoring the show and to everyone who kicks in via PayPal or the Perpetual Chess Patreon page. I also just put up a little donate directly link on the Perpetual Chess web page where it says donate. But again, if you're not in a position to donate, I'm happy to have people listening and just enjoying the show. So without further ado, I'd like to give thanks to the people who helped make Perpetual Chess possible. I would like to give thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable.com, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Apprentice Twitch Channel, Andrew Alhaji, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porteau, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, the Chess Central's Chess Blog, Chris Flanagan, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen. Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, 
Greg Harst, Greg Natal, Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, James Kennedy, Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, Lucio Casada Silva, the law offices of Stuart Katz, LilaAnalysis.com for cloud-based Lila engine analysis, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Mr. Mike Shahadi, the famous Mr. Dodgy, Peter Sodi, Reuven Fisher, Seattle Chess Club, Stephen Martinez, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of Strong Chess, Todd Kennedy, Wayne Beam, and I also would like to thank the following. Aaron Waffler, Ace Fiega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, Andy Ryerson, FM Andre Terakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Anita Deer, Barry Hessian, Better Chess Training, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Bleskachek, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dalen Shelton, Dirk Decker, Drake Domingue, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ethan Smith, Ian Mason, I am Elect, Donnie, Ariel, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Latart Lavoie, Frank Tortoris, MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Hans Schu, Haris Srinivasan, Jacob Kovacs, Jack Perry, James Aspinwall, James Bonastia, James Muir, Jason Willem, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jim Ratliff, J.J. Snod, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Slater, Jordan Goodwin, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM, Josh Friedel, I.M. Kari Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Pryor, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Ryforth, Laura Boyavsky, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Miguel Araspide, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Nigmat Mulajanov, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passan, and Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbeck, Robert Turner, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwater, Shane Unger, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatyev Abrahamian, Tim Brennan, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyrin Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William Brock, William Juniper, William Hogarth, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and last but never least, Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks for listening, everyone. I will catch you all next week.